Today's guest on Roots of the Spirit is Hisham Tafik. Hisham recently retired after serving 22 years with the New York City Fire Department. Welcome to Roots of the Spirit, Hisham. Thank you for having me. Congratulations, that's an amazing accomplishment, 22 years. Yes, um, actually 20 years. Uh, the other two I was allowed to buy a year back uh, from the Marines and a year uh, corrections. So I was able to add that on top of my 20 years. So it's All right, excellent. I want to talk a lot about your service with the fire department, but I want to go back first. Okay. So where did you grow up? And tell me about your childhood. Oh, uh, as you can see. Um, Harlem, I was born and raised in Harlem, 113th and St. Nicholas. Um, I'm the oldest of five brothers, um, raised in a Muslim community. My father was an imam. Um, homeschooled up until sixth grade, very uh, sheltered and protected. And after the sixth grade is when I went to public school and really started to get a, a taste of uh, what the world really was. So your father was an imam? My father was uh, a follower and student of Malcolm X. And when Malcolm X came back from uh, making Hajj, um, he had impressed the people out there and they gave him four scholarships. My father got one of the scholarships, so he kind of followed in Malcolm's footsteps where he went to Egypt, studied at um, Al-Azhar University um, with Islamic studies. Um, came back to New York City. Um, after Malcolm passed, he uh, founded a mosque called Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood, which kind of uh, um, followed in the footsteps of, of Mosque Incorporated, which was uh, Malcolm's mosque. So he founded the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood, kind of took over four vacant, about three to four vacant buildings that were kind of drug infested. And at the time the city was like, if you can get the drug dealers out, you can have it. So him and the brothers got the drug dealers out. So they took over these four vacant buildings and just built like this community on, on the corner of 113th Street where it was a, a health food store, a school, a mosque, um, apartment buildings. Um, it was just like this this community that was thriving with these just powerful African American Muslims. So you lost both of your parents at a young age. And yes. You were the eldest of your siblings. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Um. When I look back at it, um, it was almost like I just went into uh, survival mode. Um, so losing my mother at at four, um, I, and I remember when the cops came to the house to tell um, that my mother passed. I, I remember that, and I was four years old. I know the carpet was blue. I remember the corn I was sitting in very vividly. Um, and then my father got ill when I was a junior in high school. But when you know when he passed, um, just went into survival mode. It was just like. I, I don't think I ever had that moment of, oh, what am I going to do? Like, it was just, okay, we're going to make this rock and you're going to make it work. So, um, and that's what 17? I did. Uh, yeah, I was 17 when my father passed. So, and even though we were surrounded by all of these people in the mosque that I call my uncles and aunts, I think everybody was kind of hurt because my father was like the cornerstone or the head of of the mosque so when he passed everybody was in pain and suffering in their own personal way so um I, 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 that's a great question i don't i don't know how i what i did i just put my head down and was like let's make it work and, and i made it work so how did you first become interested in becoming a firefighter i came home from the marines and uh in my apartment i saw a postcard on the windowsill, and it was from the Vulcan Society, which I'd never heard of, but I found out later, which was the organization of black firefighters. So on a postcard was, uh, a, I believe, a black fireman, and it was like, do you want to be a firefighter? Just fill out this portion on the back. So I turned the card over, I put my name, my address, I mailed it in. Um, but I had no desire or dream as a kid to be a firefighter. I just was filling out everything to get a job. So I had always had a calling to 
emergency response. Like even when I was in camp, one of the things I loved was when the siren went off and all the lifeguards had to race to the, to the lake and put on our equipment and jump in the water and look for a body. It was a drill, but I just loved the, the adrenaline rush of, of putting on gear and responding. So they got back in touch with, uh, with me and was like, okay, we're having free tutoring. Uh, and I was like, okay, I'll go. And I go to this free tutoring and that's when I see all of these like black firefighters. And like, I'm like, okay, wow, these kind of brothers kind of remind me of the Moss. Like, all right. And they start talking about the benefits and the job and how there's not that many black firefighters. I was like, well, this sounds like, this is perfect for me. So when I found out especially the salary, how many days you work, the benefits, you get to get smoky and dirty and at the same time help people. I was like, this sounds good. Mm. The seed was planted and I'm forever grateful because the Vulcan Society had used uh, um, probably their own funds to do like an advertising. Okay, so what was it like entering the department? Uh, my first day at the academy wasn't an issue because I was already shaving my head so a lot of issues people had with shaving their hair and the big deal and taking out their earrings. I was like, I've already been in the Marines, we shaved our heads. So this, that's easy. And I remember they took, they picked me out. My first day in the academy, we're in this big auditorium. They're like, you, come up here. And I come up on the stage and they're like, you see this guy? And this is what you should look like. <laughs> clean shaven, da 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 da, press clean, da 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 da. And I was like, okay. So, and then after that, they asked, every, who has military experience? So I raised my hand, a couple other people raised their hand. They inter was, uh, interviewed us and they appointed me to the, 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 the guide leader of my platoon. And then from that day forward, I'll, I'll never forget that. Um, Every day after training, I mean, on the weekends, I would go home and I remember I would lock my bedroom door and I would stay in my bedroom that whole weekend studying. I don't think I had a social life at 24, 25. It was just that. I knew I wanted this job. I knew I had to have it. So that's all I did for those three months. Just studied, 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 worked hard, graduated. Um, I was very disappointed that this was my first time graduating where I didn't get the physical fitness award. And the person that beat me was a Marine, but he smoked and I couldn't get over how somebody who smoked could beat me. He beat me in the, uh, the run. Do you remember the first time you put on your firefighter uniform? So I'll, I remember when I had to go pick up my stuff. I think it was in Queens and I go and you pick up your bunker pants and you pick up your jacket. And I just remember going home and putting that stuff on and I call it, uh, I tell people like being a fireman is like being Superman. You put on all of that stuff and you actually feel like you could just do anything. And I put on all of that stuff and I just, that was probably one of the proudest uh, days of my life. So what's it like, a day in the life of a firefighter? Um, there's a million different emotions um, being a firefighter because each day there's always something different and unexpected. So, I mean, one day uh, you're responding to someone that's hit by a car. Um, one day you're giving CPR to uh, a parent that hasn't wake, woken up, or you're giving CPR to a kid that's collapsed on a basketball court. Um, one day you're crawling down a hallway pitch black with heat and can't see anything. Um, one day a gas explosion. I mean, there's just so many different things you deal with. Um, and there's days where you feel joy um, about doing your job. And then there's days when you're overwhelmed. So you mentioned 9-11. Mm -hmm. You were, you responded to. Everybody else is coming in. There was a public bus waiting for us. Um, we took probably every piece of gear we had in the firehouse and we threw it on this bus. About, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 of us crammed on this bus. And I'll never forget, we jump on the West Side Highway at 125th Street. West Side Highway is empty. And we're on this bus flying down the West Side Highway. 
and as you get closer, you can see in the distance, you know, this this plume of smoke. Um, by the time I got down there, building one and building two had already collapsed. Um, so when we got down there, it was just this eerie silence. And I remember looking at, and everybody forgets, it was a building number seven. And I remember looking up at building number seven and it's on fire. So we're all going to that building just to see, just out of curiosity. Um, and then I remember a chief saying on the radio, you know, everybody get out, this, this one is gonna come down. And I remember walking closer to the, I was like, there's no way in the world this building's coming down. It's just not gonna happen. And then all of a sudden you just see the building like, it's almost like Terminator when, um, when he used to change and he used to be this rippling and he would just appear out of nowhere. That's what I just remember, the building just, just started to ripple all of a sudden, doom, 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 and everybody just, and I'll never forget, I was on the phone with Hazem, my brother. I'm on the phone with Hazem, and I'm looking at it, and his connection was bad, and I just remember him, yo, be safe. I'm like, all right, and I get off, and I just start running, and then you just see the smoke, like, catching up to everybody. Um, and then after that, we just all walked around in a daze. I, you know, I just, I don't think it hit me that, I knew people were missing, but I was like, everybody's somewhere. Like, everybody must be under this pocket. I just knew everybody was alive. So we just started walking around looking for people. But I wasn't looking for people in a, um, in a pained way, like, oh my God. It was like, they're somewhere. So do you think you're in a state of disbelief? Yes, yeah. Um, and I just remember spending the whole day doing that with a group of guys. And I remember, uh, I, I remember seeing like crushed fire trucks. It was like, I drove a fire truck. So to see that crushed, it was, I was like, that's impossible. I don't think it registered. Um, and it wasn't until maybe a day or two later, a friend of mine comes up to me and he's like, you know, uh, they came out with a list, like a master list, maybe five or five pages of all these firefighters missing. And my friend comes up to me, he's like, um, you know Sean Powell's on the list. Like, uh, can't be on the list. Sean Powell's a good oh, friend. Oh, Sean Powell's a good friend of mine. He worked in my firehouse. Both our sons went to the same, he, he told me about a very good school and I enrolled my son. And we lived on the same block in Brooklyn. So I'm like, Sean Powell's not on the list. I take out my cell phone, I call Sean Powell, and I get voicemail, I'm like, yo man, hit me back. <laughs> like. Just hit me back when you get this message. And uh, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't hit me back. So um, I think that's when it hit me that, um, you know, we lost people. And um, yeah. Tell me some of your most memorable experiences working for the fire department, some of the most positive things. A lot of the positive things um, were when I was out of the firehouse, actually. Like, I remember being in the recruitment program, like, going to high schools and speaking to these kids about becoming firefighters was something I loved doing and was excited about doing. And seeing them five or seven years later becoming a firefighter, almost better than giving to my CPR and seeing them recover or just as equal. Um, another one of my greatest joys was being a drill instructor at the academy. Um, they picked me to be a drill instructor at the academy because at the time there weren't any African-American uh, instructors or drill instructors. And they wanted someone to kind of be a face for African-Americans coming through. So I went there and I was a drill instructor. So I can tell you, I can't, like the, the brothers that I helped, uh, just to give them the confidence, hey, you can get through this, you know, this is what's gonna be expected of you. Don't give in to that, you know, or speak on their behalf when they were uh, teased or because of certain things or stupid nonsense. I felt um, a sense of pride being there and being able to help them and then seeing them now on this job, having these careers and knowing that I was able to help 
help them with that, with that, those are some of my greatest um, memories and, and accomplishments, actually. Now, of course, being in a firehouse and giving CPR and putting out a fire, those are good, but the, the top ones on my list are being in that recruitment program and, and being a drill instructor. Your father. Yes. Tell us about your son, Khalil, and fatherhood. Um, fatherhood is a great job to have. I mean, you really, I mean, people think about, you know, we live in a world where everybody wants to have this power and be in charge and control and be the president and CEO. I say the most powerful position you can ever have is being a parent. I mean, just the power you have of in positive influence on your kid and showing them the right way and guiding them and, and, and installing in them the tools and, and, and making sure that they're okay to have this fruitful life, that's the most powerful thing you can do. And I have such a joy um, doing that with my son. And not just him, I come into contact with other young men. And if I can like give them anything that will make their journey easier, then I'll do it. And I, and I know how much of, um, I know how, how important it is because my uncles and my father, they did it for me. And that's why I was able to just fly through all of all the jobs I've had and all of the obstacles I've had. Be able to, I, it was very easy because of the support and the fathers I had in my life. So I try my best to duplicate that with my son and, and other young, young people. These days, a lot of people recognize you most for being the character Dembe on the hit show The Blacklist. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to use this opportunity to focus on your career with the New York City Fire Department. Mm -hmm. However, this is an important part of who you are and, and, and what you're up to these days. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a snapshot of what you're doing and how you're enjoying being on a number one hit show? It's, it's been, um, I use the word magical, but it's, it's truly been a blessing. And my dream was to be able to be a firefighter, but at the same time pursue my acting career. Even though I kept getting hit in the head with, oh, you're not serious, it's a hobby, you're an actor, you're a model, whatever it was, people would just diminish it because I had a job. <laughs> I wasn't waiting tables. It was like, because I was a firefighter, that meant I wasn't serious. But if I was waiting tables, then I was serious. So my whole thing was, no, you can, I can have a job, I can have a car, I can have some money, I can take care of my son and still pursue my acting career. So I told myself, I just need to do my 20 years, I need to book a show in the city, and everything will be fine. So as I got closer to hitting 20 years, I also started to get bigger projects. So it was almost like God-like as I'm coming to the finish line and then I'm getting jobs, and I was like, wow, this is really happening. No, really? And then it was like, boom. They're both here at the finish line. And then it was like, okay, you asked for this. Are you gonna really retire? And it, took, it almost took me like three years to wrap my head around, okay, I'm gonna retire, because I had this fear of leaving this biweekly check. And I was like, I can't turn my back on this blessing. So it's time to retire. And it just, it, it, it's a blessing from Allah, it's a blessing from God that I was able to do 20 years, 22 years, and at the same time, book a hit show, not just a regular show, an international hit show on the East Coast in New York City. So I still have access to my son, I have my pension, and now I'm doing what I really, uh, one of my other dreams, my true love, so it, it was, it's, it's having faith in yourself, it's working hard, and, 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 and I believe if you do that, then whatever you set out to do is gonna happen. So your character is Dembe Zuma. Yes. I just have one question about Dembe. Yes. Do you think you guys would be cool, Hisham and Dembe? Absolutely. And why? <laughs> because we're actually probably the same person. <laughs> in what way? I mean, I'm a loyal guy, I'm passionate, um, I'm quiet. Um, I'll ride with you if, if I, I'll, I'll ride for you or with you if I believe in what you believe in. Um, yeah. 
And so you've mentioned in many, many interviews that you just love working with the cast and. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, we watch, we watch these, uh, anytime we look back on something that was a hit or something that's gonna last forever, not only is the writing great, the directing great, but when you look at the cast members, the chemistry was dead on perfect. You look back at The Wire, the cast members, all those guys still hang out together. You know what I mean? So the Blacklist cast, the chemistry is magic. So when you have that mixture, you, wh whatever script, I mean, it's, you're gonna have fun, you're gonna have a ball, and, and I believe that's why it's such a success. It's a perfect marriage between work and talent. What are the roots of your spirit? <sighs> what are the roots of my spirit? Um, Hisham means one who gives. It means one, in Arabic it means one who breaks bread, one who gives. And I think that is kind of my make up my DNA. I just always, sometimes to a fault, uh, want to give to other people, want to help other people. I guess that's why I'm a firefighter. That's why I went to the Marines. That's why I was a correction officer. I like to serve and help. Um, so I think that's my makeup. The, the roots of my spirit is to break bread, to give back, to help, um, to protect, to provide. Um, and I guess my journey has been to find out how to do that without sacrificing yourself, without ignoring yourself. Um, but yes, that's the roots of my spirit, to break bread, to give.